Um, welcome back everybody to ECTU. This is our last lecture in a five-part series where we've talked about enviro environmental regulations um, in the United States. Uh, my name is Andy Cooper and as you know I'm with ECT and uh, I'm based here in Chicago. I welcome back our featured speaker, Mr. Mark Richardson, who most of us know, he's a former assistant prosecuting attorney for water quality in Macomb County and adjunct professor at Oakland University um, in, in the environmental law program. Today's one hour lecture will focus on protecting wildlife and preserving biodiversity under the Endangered Species Act. For all our listeners, please post your questions again in the chat box and we will lead a Q&A uh, for the last 15 minutes and we'll conclude with a short quiz. Uh, just to avoid, avoid interruptions, please mute yourself and um, a final reminder for any of our attendees who would like a certificate for continuing education, please uh, fill out the form that is on the source. And if you need help finding that, you can always email me. Thank you, I'll turn it over to Mark. Uh, thanks, Andy, uh, and thank you, uh, Sanjeev. Um, so, uh, as usual, we have an awful lot of material to cover. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, do some justice to it. And uh, uh, let's dive in. Uh, I want to uh, put the discussion of uh, the Endangered Species Act into a little bit of context before I get into it. Um, uh, many commentators believe that we're uh, either entering or on the verge of entering uh, a sixth grade extinction uh, in the history of this planet. Um, and uh, there's uh, certainly a lot of alarming evidence that uh, we are uh, uh, losing species at, at, at uh, uh, unseen levels. Um, for example, uh, the uh, United Nations issued a report this year uh, warning that uh, over 1 million, uh, or about 1 million plant and animal species face extinction, possible extinction in this century. Uh, and that figure, according to the UN, includes um, one fifth of mammalian species and one eighth of, of total bird species. Um, just uh, to kind of supplement that uh, uh, report, um, uh, I've gathered a few things. Uh, North America has lost 30% of its bird populations since 1970, over the past 50 years. There's been an 80% decline in the number of flying insects, again, the populations. Um, in terms of spe threatened species, 25% of sharks and rays uh, worldwide are endangered. 33% of amphibians are, are endangered. And 200 of the 300 North American freshwater mussel species are, are threatened. And uh, we have the, uh, the bar graph, uh, which uh, breaks down the details of, um, of, of the threat. Um, uh, uh, you know, more than I just did. Um, I had to look up what a, a cycad was. It's a, 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 a fern tree that's been around since dinosaur times, and it looks like uh, the, the cycads uh, are um, particularly threatened. Um, I'm colorblind, so it's, it's hard for me to distinguish these colors, but uh, uh, the uh, critically endangered species are the, are, are the bright red. Uh, the um, species groups, that this is actually species groups. Um, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, mankind is the, is the cost of, 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 the, of, the, of this particular crisis. Um, the usual suspects, um, agriculture, mining, logging, urban sprawl. Uh, invasive species in a, in a world global economy, um, the problem of invasive species is greater than ever. And of course, invasive species can devastate biodiversity uh, in, uh, in uh, exotic locations. Um, we see that in, uh, in North American wetlands, um, uh, for example. Um, uh, so um, there's a, there's a huge problem uh, out there. How has the uh, federal government of the United States 
responded to that. Um, the, the primary vehicle is the uh, Federal Endangered Species Act, which was passed in uh, 1973. And uh, this was a uh, pioneering law at the time. It served as a model for many similar laws throughout the world. Uh, the uh, thing that you note initially about it is that it prohibits harm to threatened or endangered species uh, and their habitats anywhere in the world. This is a, uh, a law of worldwide applicability. Um, it, the law protects species which are listed uh, as endangered or threatened pursuant to procedures established by the Endangered Species Act. So it does not, um, it does not protect um, in, endangered or threatened or rare species in a, in a generic way. Uh, there has to be a, a, a process uh, invoked and completed uh, before the, the protections of the law kick in. And um, right now, um, I've got uh, two, 2,100, there's about 2,200 um, plant and animal species that are listed that have been formally designated as endangered or threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Um, obviously, that's a small subset of the overall number of species which are threatened with extinction throughout the world. Um, as, as we'll see, there's at least some potential for getting uh, bang for your buck by uh, listing, um, uh, you know, the, the so-called megafauna um, because they need, uh, they need a, a rich ecosystem to, to, to thrive in and that involves preserving many other species. But um, the fact remains that this is a um, this is a stab in the right direction rather than a comprehensive um, uh, a protection plan for worldwide species uh, preservation. Of the 2,200 uh, species, uh, there are more plants listed than animals. Um, there are about, um, I'm going to use round figures here, 1,700 of the 2,100 are North American plants and animals. There's uh, a few hundred uh, foreign um, or, or non uh, non species non native to uh, uh, this continent uh, on that list. Um, okay, so how does the law actually work um, uh, to um, protect species? Well, I mentioned the listing process, and um, the listing uh, of endangered species is. Um, is non-discretionary. Uh, the uh, listing is started with a petition and the petition can be um, filed by any, any, any person uh, or it can be um, a self-initiated listing by the U.S. Department of Interior, which uh, is the U.S. Uh, agency responsible for administering the Endangered Species Act. The two um, uh, bureaus of the Department of Interior that are most involved with the Endangered Species Act are the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service, which uh, handles endangered species listing and protection activities in the oceans. Uh, the bulk of the, of the work is performed by the Fish and Wildlife Service for terrestrial and freshwater uh, species. Um, so, um, uh, listing uh, is initiated with a petition to list and um, the, the listing of a species as threatened or endangered is non-discretionary with the Department of Interior upon a finding that a um, uh, species is either threatened or endangered. Um, what, um, what, is the, what are the definitions of threatened or endangered if we could go back a slide, please. Um, go back to the previous slide. Uh, endangered means in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. Um, threatened means likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. Uh, the language of these definitions is kind of pregnant with meaning. 
and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, um, firstly, all or significant portion of its range um, implies that you have to designate uh, habitat along with designating uh, species as endangered or threatened. Um, and indeed, the law does require that critical habitat be designated. Uh, however, uh, habitat designations are very problematic and they tend to lag behind uh, species designations uh, in terms of uh, how fast the, bureau the bureaucracy uh, uh, works. Um, there are some uh, recent changes to the Endangered Species Act pertaining to designating uh, critical habitat. Um, for a long time, the law um, uh, permitted uh, uh, the uh, Interior Department to uh, consider uh, critical habitat as, as habitat that was currently occupied by an endangered species or was within the historical range or was of a type that could support an endangered species. Um, last year, the uh, department um, uh, amended its rules. Uh, now, critical habitat is confined to designating areas where endangered species currently exist. Um, that, um, that change is subject to court challenge, um, but um, it's... Uh, and it's still possible to designate critical habitat outside of the current range. But what, what the agency is, is now doing is, is using uh, all of the areas where the species exist and designating that first uh, before even considering whether to designate additional areas. Um, so um, I'll return to this. Um, um, in a uh, in, in a moment in a moment um, the uh, other big change is in regards to threatened species um, the definition says foreseeable it's foreseeable that the uh, species could become endangered in the uh, so, what does foreseeable mean? Um, the, the 2019 change uh, narrowed what the definition of foreseeability is to so far in the future as the agency reasonably can reasonably determine future threats and responses. Uh, that is uh, actually the first time any parameters are put around this, this word foreseeable. Some people feel that it precludes, it's going to preclude uh, the agency from uh, designating threatened species on the basis of climate change considerations because they are too far into the future. Uh, that's a disputed topic, but um, uh, it, again, is subject to uh, um, uh, litigation in the courts. It's, uh, I, I can't predict whether the, the new definition of foreseeability will hold up. I also can't predict really whether, you know, how the agency will choose to interpret that. Um, um, but it does seem to be uh, narrowing the, um, the, uh, the temporal plane, <laughs> if you will, of, of determining the, whether a species is, is threatened. Uh, one more change I want to mention in terms of listing process. Um, I said that it's non-discretionary based on five factors. Uh, those factors are all biological factors and ecological factors. Um, however, listing uh, analyses now uh, under the new changes have to include economic analysis as well. The economic impact of listing a species as endangered or threatened and uh, has to be explained uh, in, in the course of the list you know, of making the listing decision. Now, I want to stress that the five factors are still the, the exclusive basis for making listing or 
listing decisions. Um, the economic information is advisory in nature, but some kind of see it as a foot in the door toward uh, uh, introducing cost benefit analysis to uh, the listing uh, process. Uh, when it comes to habitat designations, um, uh, cost has always been a, uh, a, a relevant factor. So there is a distinction between uh, listing species and designating habitat as far as considerations of cost go. Okay, so it's listed as threatening, threatened or endangered. What's next? What, how does the law actually protect uh, listed species? There's three ways of doing that. Uh, we can go on to the, uh, the next slide. Yeah, um, three basic strategies. One is to close the uh, marketing chain. Uh, the, the Endangered Species Act makes it illegal to uh, buy and sell a listed species and to buy and sell products manufactured from listed species. So, uh, for example, you cannot uh, uh, sell, uh, import uh, uh, powder made from rhinoceros horns and sell it as an aphrodisiac in, in, in the United States. Uh, uh, there are certain kinds of alligators that are listed as endangered or threatened. Uh, alligator shoes would be uh, illegal as well. Um, so the idea is just to close the U.S. market to um, trade in endangered spe species or products derived therefrom, and there's very severe uh, criminal penalties connected with doing that. It's basically reduced uh, the trade in, in such products and species to the black market. Um, I'll be spending most of my time, though, on the next two prongs of, of, of the three-part strategy. Um, uh, one has to do with, with, with um, uh, regulating the actions of the United States government. Um, and I've quoted some, some I, I've got a truncated quote here of the language from Section 7 of the ESA. Uh, which requires the U.S. government to ensure that actions authorized, funded, or carried out uh, by it do not jeopardize the continued existence of endangered or threatened species or result in the destruction or modification of uh, critical habitat. Uh, well, what does that add up to? Um, when the act was passed, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that those who uh, were involved uh, believed that this was going to be an essentially a paper shuffling uh, requirement, uh, planning requirement, a uh, kind of a bureaucratic uh, process. Um, something happened to change that. Um, the, the, a, a scientist working in the, uh, a branch of the Little Tennessee River uh, in Tennessee discovered a uh, kind of a mini perch called the snail darter, a uh, hitherto unknown species. And uh, since it was apparent that the, this stretch of river was the only place left where that species of fish existed, a petition was filed and the Interior Department listed the snail darter as an endangered species. Um, so far, so good. Um, the problem was that the United States government was planning to dam up that stretch of river. Um, it was constructing through the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a federal agency, the Teleco Dam. And um, uh, the TVA is a dam building agency, dam good building agency. Uh, it had uh, dammed up the entire Tennessee River system. All of the potential uh, sites had been used except for the Teleco Dam site. This was the last um, uh, last site where a dam could be constructed and it was going to destroy the last free flowing stretch of the Little Tennessee River. No wonder the snail darter was um, endangered. Uh, so a lawsuit was filed 
to uh, obtain an injunction against the dam. Uh, the uh, case wound its way up to the United States Supreme Court. And um, to everyone's shock, uh, the court ruled that the injunction would stand, that the dam could not be completed. And at the time the decision was made in 1978, the Talco Dam was 90% complete. Millions and millions of dollars had been spent to construct the dam. It was almost ready to go. The court disregarded that. And it said this language you're looking at right here, if you parse it carefully, prohibits the, the federal government or any of its agencies from doing anything that would jeopardize the continued existence of an endangered species. That means that the dam couldn't be completed because it would jeopardize the snail darter. Um, this was framed at the time as an outrage. Uh, you know, worthless little fish defeats, um, you know, a, a dam for which millions of taxpayers' dollars had already been spent. Um, we can talk about the deeper implications of uh, the decision. Um, uh, this, and, and I'm not sure I have time to do that, but um, just think about the implications of uh, destroying the last free-flowing um, portion of a, of a of a river, a river which has uh, um, ecological, recreational, and historical significance. Uh, the case is really about a lot more than the snail darter. The case, by the way, is called TVA versus Hill, Tennessee Valley Authority versus Hill, and it is one of the um, most famous environmental cases uh, in U.S. history. Uh, the outrage led to a amendment to the uh, uh, ESA uh, to permit um, uh, uh, variances, if you want to call it that, um, which would actually permit uh, the destruction of um, species upon, um, 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 you know, a, a, a showing. And um, the amendment uh, said that if you could petition the agency to exempt a species from this provision, if there was no prudent or feasible alternative to destruction, if the benefits clearly outweighed the cost, or if the project that would cause the destruction was of regional or national significance. And the amendment actually specifically directed the committee which was set up to, to evaluate these factors, to evaluate the Telco Dam and the Snail Darter, which it did. Uh, the committee uh, was, uh, uh, quickly dubbed the God Committee, sometimes the God Squad. Uh, there was a show on TV at the time called the Mod Squad. Uh, so, of course, this became the God Squad. Uh, the committee members, though, didn't resemble the actors in the Mod Squad very much. Um, they were they tended to be old um, conservative people. <laughs> anyway, these old conservative people applied these factors to the snail darter case uh, and to, again, to everyone's shock, the, the, the committee turned down the exemption for the snail darter. Um, one of the committee members summarized it this way. If you just take the cost of completing this dam, just what's left, and weigh it against the uh, the costs of um, the, the benefits that the, that, that the dam would bring, it doesn't pay. Just the cost of completing it versus the benefits. So factor two I gave you was benefits clearly outweigh the costs. Uh, this committee found just the opposite. Uh, and it denied the exemption. Um, which may or may not tell us something about the way the federal government actually carries on its business uh, on a day-to-day, year-to-year basis outside of public scrutiny. Um, just to kind of wrap this up, um, a, uh, a uh, uh, writer was attached to a spending bill uh, after the God Committee made its decision 
uh, specifically exempting the sale order from the ESA and directing the immediate completion of the Teleco Dam. The Telco Dam was completed. Uh, they were able to find a new home for the snail darter in some adjacent waters uh, 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 in other places in Tennessee. So there's still a small uh, uh, reproducing population of snail darters in existence in this world. Um, there's a lot of implications in this case. I really uh, commend you to learn more about it. Uh, I have to move on. The uh, God Committee has been invoked only a few, only a handful of times since it's, it was created. I believe only two uh, plant species have ever been uh, given an exemption um, through action of that committee. Um, so, um, absolute prohibition against the federal government or its agency from taking actions which jeopardize the endangered species. There's been a, there, there's been a, um, an entire a framework of uh, bureaucratic consultations uh, uh, put together. Uh, um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, land management at the end of this. And um, uh, the idea is to incorporate uh, species protection in, in, in agency decision-making. And um, that also has its pros and cons, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I want to turn to the third prong of um, the um, uh, ESA strategy, and that's to prohibit a quote unquote taking uh, an endangered species. Um, Section nine of the act prohibits any person from quote taking, and I've put the, uh, um, um, the definitional uh, terms, uh, harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect. That's what section nine says is a taking. Um, unlike section seven, the, what I was talking about with respect to the snail darter case, section nine applies to everybody. It applies to any person, not just the federal government. So it, it, it has a dramatic impact. Um, and one reason for that impact is a case called um, uh, Babbitt uh, versus uh, Sweet Home Chapter of Communities for a Greater Oregon. Um, let's look at that word harm for a minute. Um, does harm to a... Um, a, a rare uh, to an endangered or a threatened species include harming its habitat. The Supreme Court in the Babbitt case held that yes, if you um, alter or destroy um, habitat, um, then you uh, are you 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 have you have done a taking, and there's very severe penalties, civil and criminal, for violating. Um, the Endangered Species Act uh, for doing a, 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 a taking. Um, you can imagine the impact that this has. Um, if, if it applies to everybody, it applies to private landowners. Um, most private landowners are not trained wildlife biologists. Most may not have any clue that they actually harbor endangered species on their land. And even if they do, uh, the act really restricts uh, what they may or may not do uh, with their private property in order to avoid um, committing a takings. Um, so um, this is a source of a lot of conflict, particularly west of the Mississippi, where most most of these controversies seem to play out because of the um, um, the lifestyles out there and the vast amount of federal land out there, uh, vast amount of open land out there. Um, uh, we see these conflicts bubble up. Um, over the years, the act has been modified and both by uh, statutory modification and uh, agency policy to try to kind of bl blunt the impact of the takings um, 
part of the law. Um, so um, I've listed some of them on this slide. Um, probably the primary strategy is the incidental take permit. Um, the, um, the, the ESA will allow a taking, allow people to obtain permits to do one of the things listed up there if uh, there is a contingent, if there's a habitat conservation plan in effect for the, the area where the taking uh, could occur. What's a habitat conservation plan? Well, it is a agreement between, in some cases, uh, individual landowners, in, in many cases, uh, between the agency and a, an entire community uh, to, um, you know, have a plan in place to preserve habitat for endangered species. There's, a, there's been about a, there's about a thousand of these habitat conservation plans, again, mostly west of the Mississippi, around 850 of them are um, uh, currently active. Um, and, and this involves, you know, like an intensive land use planning exercise to, um, uh, you know, to assure that, uh, um, you know, there's adequate habitat. Um, but if such a plan is in place, then, uh, you know, uh, takings within those areas can be excused. Now it says incidental take, that means that, um, uh, the taking would occur if incidental to a lawful activity. And, and that means that you're not, it, it kind of precludes uh, kill, uh, trap, capture, or collect, shoot, wound. Um, basically, the focus is on the harm element of a taking, and, and we're talking about things like building a house or um, um, a commercial area, a parking lot, uh, you know, that sort of activity which may harm uh, the habitat of endangered species, but it's not it's not deliberately directed at the species. That's what an incidental take permit um, permits. Um, there's also some policies um, um, in place. Um, the uh, no surprises policy uh, relates to the uh, habitat conservation plans. And it provides an incentive for landowners and for communities to enter into these plans. Uh, what is that incentive? If, if you have a plan in place and it turns out that that conservation plan is not adequate for some reason or another, it's not doing the job and it has to be modified. Perhaps the area has to be expanded. Perhaps the hydrology has to be changed. Um, new planting could be any number of things. Uh, who's going to pay for those modifications? Under the no surprises policy, the federal government agrees to pay for them. Um, this provides an additional incentive um, to enter into habitat conservation plans. These plans are, are voluntary uh, agreements. Um, another uh, interesting uh, initiative is the so-called safe harbor agreement. Safe harbor agreement um, uh, allows um, uh, a landowner to um, enter into an agreement to actually create a habitat for an endangered species. Um, and the landowner would, would be allowed to subsequently, later on, destroy that habitat uh, or change it without triggering the um, sanctions of the Endangered Species Act. And uh, this gets at a problem, uh, a, you know, kind of perverse incentive problem that the, uh, uh, that the law creates. Um, you know, if you, if, if, if you uh, are uncertain whether you have, um, you know, uh, endangered species habitat and the agency, I've mentioned that the, the habitat designations, they lag. The agency hasn't gotten around to identifying endangered species on your property. 
you might kind of try to accelerate uh, the uh, destruction of the habitat before anybody uh, could catch on. And um, uh, we don't want that as, a, as, a, as an overall rule. So um, we try to encourage um, through various ways, uh, you know, habitat uh, conservation and, and, and expansion. Uh, and this is one way to do it, the Safe Harbor Agreement. Um, so um, these are the, I've, I've kind of gone through real quick, the three main strategies, and I'm kind of getting short on time, but um, how effective has all this been? Um, we do get some, like I said, some additional bang for the buck by protecting megafauna. Uh, we're getting a lot of um, uh, subsequent um, uh, or lower on the food chain protection that way. Um, and we had our, our efforts have been effective insofar as the species that have been listed as endangered or protected have mostly been saved from extinction. Uh, uh, the problem is the species which are not listed, we, we never get around to listing. Um, what's the root of this problem? This law is actually, the approach to this law is actually kind of managing species for extinction or for, for, from the brink of extinction. It's kind of a crisis management approach. A species has to actually be um, threatened with extinction before we can even begin to protect it. And, um, you know, that's playing catch up and uh, playing catch up is always more expensive and more of a burden on everybody than, um, th than you know, a more comprehensive um, approach would be, a, a, you know, a more proactive approach would be. Um, some have suggested maybe going to um, a, a uh, eco-preserve type system. And this was actually uh, seriously discussed for Western grasslands uh, back in the 80s and 90s. That was before the fracking boom though. So uh, that kind of scotched to talk of that. So, so what I want to talk now briefly about is, um, I'm running short of time, is federal land management. Um, first of all, it goes without saying that the Endangered Species Act pertains to um, all federal land management activities. Um, so um, protection of endangered species has to be incorporated into those activities, no matter what they are. Um, also the National Environmental Policy Act, which we talked about in the initial lecture, applies to, pertains to all of these uh, activities. So the planning process has to provide for protection of ecological values. Um, uh, as, as it as it goes on, but um, let's just step back a minute. Um, the U.S. government is the major landholder in the United States. Um, it, it owns 640 million acres of land, which is 28 percent of the total U.S. land mass. West of the Mississippi, it owns over 50 percent of the entire land mass, and um, various federal agencies uh, are. Um, in charge of managing um, uh, all or portions of this of the huge uh, expanse of land. Bureau of Land Management manages 243 million acres. U.S. Forest Service, 193 million acres. And then we have uh, direct management by Fish and Wildlife, the National Park System, that's, uh, seven, that's about 80 million acres. And even the Department of, of Defense, 11 million acres. Um, how 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 do they pull this off? Um, the um, two major agencies, uh, by acreage anyway, the uh, BLM uh, and the Forest Service, uh, are they manage their holdings under um, statutes which are uh, referred to as multiple use and sustained yield statutes. Um, this means that uh, by law, these agencies are directed to, um, to uh, uh, 
conserve and enhance the productivity of their of their holdings for a multitude of uses. Uh, for example, the Federal Land Policy Management Act of 1976 lists the following uses for which uh, the land must be uh, managed. Recreation, range, timber, water, wildlife, fish, minerals, scenic, scientific, and historical values. And the, the BLM must um, um, accommodate all of those values, balance them, to optimize present and future uses, this this uh, statute actually takes into account the, the, the need to preserve um, uh, holdings for future um, generations. Um, National Forest Management Act is also a multiple use uh, statute. Um, um, all of the planning activities both these agencies engage in are supposed to accommodate all of these uses. Uh, Many commentators believe that this approach is uh, not effective. Um, the, uh, the way um, um, activities are conducted are heavily influenced by uh, particular stakeholders. And uh, those would be farmers and ranchers in the case of the BLM and, and uh, the logging industry in the case of the Forest Service. And um, we see over and over again, we see fights between um, between business interests and ranching and forestry indus in industry interests and um, uh, uh, environmental groups, uh, conservation groups, and so forth, Na sometimes Native American groups, over uh, agency management activities. Uh, most, of the, uh, most of the controversies revolve around uh, the um, uh, you know, the, the economic pro productivity uh, uses, the uh, uh, timber leasing, the um, mineral and uh, petroleum leasing activities of these agencies. Uh, they're all theoretically subject to ESA and NEPA, um, and um, they're all supposed to balance uses. Um, we see over and over again uh, um, instances where uh, leasing programs do not seem to actually protect the uh, ecological interests that they're supposed to. Uh, and um, uh, I'm uh, zipping through this whole uh, subject matter pretty fast, but um, uh, I just want to, um, uh, you know, just just want to kind of touch on this and, um, you know, kind of conclude by saying that the multiple multi-uses have built-in conflicts and uh, the biases are, 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 are more extensive than just lobbying biases. There are subsidies uh, for the, uh, the ranching, mining, and logging activities that are built into the law, which uh, you know, which further promote those th those kind of uses at the expense of the other uh, uses that the laws that, that the management laws are supposed to protect. And uh, I have to kind of wrap it up right here, I guess. Um, but I can answer questions, and um, we can we can do our quiz. Um, okay, uh, I'm stopping right now. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, so we're gonna run through just a couple quick questions to pique your interest um, and follow up on what Mark said. And then we do have a couple questions in the chat that we'll talk about in a second. All right, number one, what percentage of the species listed as endangered or threatened by extinction have been saved by conservation initiatives resulting from the Endangered Species Act? And if you want, you can go ahead and put your answer in the chat. We'll give it just a second here. Marsha, you wanna go to the next slide? We'll reveal our numbers. So 99%. Mark, do you wanna make a comment on this? Yeah, that, what, what, that, that means is that um, uh, of the, of the uh, <laughs> Of the species that have been listed, 99% uh, have been um, 
extinction has been prevented for 99% of them. Um, only a, a smaller percentage have been actually delisted. Uh, in other words, restored ecological health. Uh, just yesterday, the agents, the, the Interior Department decided to delist the, uh, the northern gray wolf. Um, that's going to uh, draw some, some litigation too. Um, over the question of whether it it, it, it can thrive in its uh, in, in it, it's really thriving in its critical habitat or or no, um, but yeah, um, um, if if a species gets listed, the odds are very very good that it's it's not going to become extinct at least while the ESA is still in uh, effect. Great, thanks. Um, okay, next slide. Question two. Just one plant may provide food and or shelter to more than how many species of animals? Okay. It's 30. 30. <laughs> and I should uh, preface this by saying these questions came from Thought Co, which is a resource, an online resource. They, the quiz was produced in 2019, and um, that website has a lot of educational resources on it. So we discussed the merits of these questions and the accuracy, and um, Mark had a good point that I'd ask him to repeat, if you don't mind, Mark. Uh, when we get to that slide or? Okay, all right, next question. Number three, how many species have disappeared in the last 500 years? Okay, next. 816. Okay. Okay, we'll go to question four. As of October 2020, so this month, how many plants and animals in the United States were listed as endangered or threatened under the Endangered Species Act? And this question brought up some conversation before everyone logged on, so um, I invite Mark to comment on that when we show the answer. Okay, next slide. So, okay. Um, I don't know if anybody got the answer to that, but um, that's just in the United States. Um, there is a, uh, over 2,200 total species on the Endangered Species Act list, um, uh, including, you know, like rare crocodiles and rhinoceroses and things that are not found in in, uh, in North America. But uh, uh, given the practicalities of how law works, uh, it, it's most impactful in the, in the jurisdiction where it's uh, been passed. So uh, most of the listed species are North American species. And of that 1,600, uh, the majority of them uh, are plants. Um, uh, it's about a 55 to 45% in round figures uh, split between uh, plants and, 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 and animals. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, I think we have one more question. How can you help protect endangered species from extinction? And we, we chuckled about this one. Um, it kind of leaves us on a high note. Um, and the answer is all of the above. So reduce, recycle, reuse, protect natural habitat, and landscape with native plants. I'm not a scientist, but I, I think I can agree with this, the answer to this question. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And it speaks to ECT, so um, that's a fun one to end on. Mark, we did have two questions in the chat. The first one, uh, what does it mean that the permit is non-discretionary? Um, the, the listing is non-discretionary. Not the permit, the listing. The, okay. The, if the agency receives a petition to list a species, it's got 90 days to decide whether to 
entertain that petition to initiate a study. It's got one year to decide whether to list or not list. There's a variety of um, uh, bureaucratic dodges, if you want to be cynical about it, that they can extend that one year period. Actually, the average time uh, for a listing these days is closer to 12 years than one year. Most of that is because of lack of information about the, the species or the, the, the remaining habitat. But um, once those five non-economic factors are met, uh, then the species must be listed. Um, and there have been lawsuits forcing uh, the uh, Department of Interior to, to list um, species that has declined to do so uh, because those factors were in fact met. The litigants proved that those factors were met and uh, it, it's not up to the uh, discretion of the agency to ignore those factors. Great, thank you for clarifying. Um, the last question is an important one. Um, how do we defend against the US FWS citing indirect impacts of project development, such as tree clearing on listed bats? Um, there's been, the US FWS has been stating lately that seasonal tree clearing is not enough to avoid indirect impacts. And they're requiring more and more in terms of surveying, mitigation, um, et cetera. Um, I want to make sure I understand the question. Um, uh, is, is this question quite... came from Jessica, who I invite to unmute. If if Jessica, if you want to chime in sure. or. Yeah, I can unmute. Um, so you. bottom line is that they, you know, we've always had when we have to do our coordination with the agencies, usually there's a federal nexus. So we have to do the coordination. We're required to do the coordination with the agencies. And right. what we're finding is that um, they've put in place, they, you know, procedures or or requirements for things to not impact let's say federal listed bats um, wow. seasonal tree clearing is a one national uh, guideline that they have required um, and that seasonal tree clearing was enough so that you clear in the winter when the bats aren't roosting recently that's not been enough and so we're finding more and more the agencies are not in agreement, depending on the state you're in, um, how much forested area is too much. So you might have in Michigan, um, they decide 10 acres of forested area. If you're clearing that, then it meets some kind of threshold that it's not written down anywhere. <laughs> and yeah. um, you, you that, but in Kentucky, it's 100 acres. Um, mm. And so I'm trying to figure out where this, if it's not in the law and it's not written down in the law, how much leeway can the agencies take when they're um, putting these arbitrary thresholds down? Uh, is, is the bat, uh, is it endangered or threatened? Yes. Well, there's there's one that's endangered and then one that's uh, threatened under, under the 4D rule, which we're finding may change here in the next year anyways. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say if it's if it's threatened, the um, habitat designations are um, basically done on a case by case basis. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure you can find any un uniformity um, throughout the United States. Uh, you're yeah, what I'm just there. trying to figure out is where where does the law stop and then the agencies are interpreting the law, where does that start and when is there us as consultants can push back to a certain extent and say, wait a minute, this isn't in the law or is that a new level where the lawyers get involved? Well, <laughs> I think I think what you're talking about is probably um no, you're not going to find it in the law. You're not going to find uh, tree clearing standards uh, in, in in you know in 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 the the legal level. Of, you, um, so what it would boil down to is whether the agency is act is is exercise sound scientific judgment uh, in deciding. Um, how much and to what the scope of tree clearing uh, has to be. 
uh, and a, a, if the matter were litigated, the, the, the judge would have to decide whether um, uh, the plan, whatever the plan that's being imposed is, was uh, sufficient to not um, threat, not not jeopardize the continued existence of the uh, of the uh, of the bat, uh, or or not. And um, it, it, the the other the the other wrinkle to it is that it when a judge is deciding that it does not have does make not make that decision on a on a nationwide basis it's it's um uh the issue is whether it's threatened in all or a significant portion of its range so um you know if a portion of its range is in michigan and other portions in kentucky uh those would be two separate issues to a uh to a, to a court um so i think I, I i i'm not sure there's a way out of the of the question that you're posing because i think that uh, um i think it's probable that the agency has the uh the right to impose different standards and different plans in, in different locations got it are you sure you got it <laughs> <laughs> no i mean it, it's bottom line they can take the liberty to to basically interpret it and impose depending on the region so that ma that makes sense i mean yes. that's yes, it's, it's like that not just for bats but across all of our threatened endangered species um we keep encountering the same Yes, issue, yes, be, because they don't they don't make the decision on a nationwide basis. It's all or a significant portion of their habitat. So, um, if it's threatened in Michigan, it's not you can't. The agency is going to say, "Well, they're still a, they're still surviving in Kentucky, so we don't have to worry about Michigan." That that's that's not 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 the way that they're going to make the decision. And um, you know the, the the plan in the individual state probably will vary depending on the the um you know the uh the condition of the bat population in that state um uh, so okay well thank you for that uh tough question jessica and uh answering it um so eloquently mark okay well um, um, before we go any further, I, I do want to just say thank you very much to uh, ETC and particularly to Marsha and Andy for, um, you know, for putting the polish on this, um, these presentations that I would never have been able to do. Um, uh, that, that you were both great to work with, and and I want to thank uh, uh, Sanjeev uh, as well for coming up with the idea uh, for for these uh, 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 webinars and supporting uh, what we're doing uh, throughout. So thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, it's it's been a pleasure. These have been enlightening and and really resourceful. Um, I'll remind everyone that they will be available on the source. And um, again, if you would like continuing ed credits, um, there's also an opportunity for that. So with that, um, I say goodbye. Happy Halloween. Um, hope you all enjoy yourselves this weekend. And uh, we look forward to the next time we can get together at ECTU. Thank you. Thank you.